welcome to another episode of So You Want to Lead a Party. I'm Reagan, and this week we don't have a Nathan. He's dealing with a few things, and I didn't want to cancel this week's episode. This week, we are focusing in on Elizabeth Warren. Elizabeth Warren was born June 22nd, 1949 in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. She was considered very much a diehard conservative and in fact was registered as a Republican from 1991 to 1996. She says that she joined the Republican Party because she felt it best matched her views when it came to uh, the economy and also uh, protections of middle-class families. She later moved to the democratic field and is considered a progressive. She is looking to uh, have the minimum wage match inflation because the reality is minimum wage is supposed to be the minimum amount of money you need to earn to be able to care for yourself and your family. It should not be something so low that you have to have multiple jobs in order to be able to care for yourself and a child and also have shelter and have food and have uh, medical insurance. She taught law before going into politics. And one of the things that she did that is highly controversial is that she listed herself as indigenous or Native American stating that uh, she is part of the Cherokee tribe. So this led to a lot of issues. One, you cannot be a citizen of a tribe unless that tribe makes you a citizen. So there is, and I don't know all of the ins and outs of it, but it is very tribe sp uh, specific. Now, according to Elizabeth Warren, there is a family history and apparently she took a DNA test because our uh, last uh, she, uh, last person who occupied the White House, uh, 45, said that he, they would donate a certain amount of money if she took a DNA test. So she did. And he basically, as we all anticipated, reneged on that. But according to the DNA test, it showed that a past ancestor six to ten generations ago may have been indigenous or native american dna tests as anyone who studies dna will let you know they are skewed because there isn't enough uh information for the different racial and ethnic groups so it can very much come out uh, uh, skewed and she got herself into a lot of trouble with that, uh, she was the first female senator from Massachusetts and was, was one of 20 female senators in 2013, which at that time had been the largest number of female sen senators in American history. So that is Elizabeth Warren. Now, even though Nate is not here, he did give me his build for Elizabeth Warren. So let's take a look at that. And for his build, he made Elizabeth Warren a variant human, the Sentinel feat. She is a Beastmaster Ranger, level 20, with the background of a folk hero. He did this because she's slightly hippie-ish fighter equivalent with a trusty uh, animal companion, aka her dog Bailey. Uh, very versatile. Warren is skilled, passionate, and a good communicator in tune with the needs of the world. She's looking to, and this is what gets me about calling someone a progressive, they are just looking at what the majority of Americans want. So to call someone as a politician who is following the will of the people, progressive seems antiquated. They're doing what they're supposed to do. They're doing their job. It's like, if you hire me to plant some 
bushes in your front yard and I plant the bushes in your front yard, you will not call me a progressive landscaper. You will call me a landscaper. Okay, that's me off my soapbox. Uh, would role play as a largely peaceful, very committed and positive party member who will also adjust if called on their BS. So Nate would play his build for Elizabeth Warren as the person who is going to basically say, look, we really need to do it this way. This is the proper way. This is the peaceful way instead of going head first into it, sort of like a rogue or very much a barbarian. Uh, her initiative is a plus four with a armor class of 16. So she's got the studded leather armor. Uh, so the 12 plus her dex modifier, that equals 16. Uh, for her spells, He's got a few for her. Due to her fighting style, she can use two druid cantrips. And so he gave her guidance. And I think I'm going to mispronounce this, and I'm pretty sure I am. I think it's called Shillelagh. Uh, Shillelagh lets you beat enemies with uh, a magic stick using your wisdom. So Nate thought that was pretty neat. Uh, he also gave her Pass Without Trace, which is a good stealth spell. Spike Growth, which I've used before and I really like because it controls uh, your enemies and also controls their path to you or wherever you and your party are. So essentially what it does is that it, it sticks up these spikes, sort of like a really... Uh, scary rose garden without the roses, just nothing but spikes. And each time as this enemy or someone that you don't want getting close to you is trying to get closer to you, they have to keep doing uh, saving throws. Uh, so for him, he said it was a good area control, lets you maybe drag enemies over spiky ground. So who wouldn't think that's fun? Uh, Goodberry, it's an on-the-go healing uh, spell. And Hunter's Mark, it's very good for extra damage on weapons attack. For the ability scores, Strength is an 8, Dexterity 18, Constitution 17, Intelligence 12, Wisdom 20, and Charisma 8. So it sounds like Nate would use his Elizabeth Warren not as your frontline person, but more of the middle back so that they are throwing out those spells, but also your reasoning force. So this is the character, in my opinion, you would place near the barbarian and the rogue because you want somebody to be able to say to them, hey, calm down for a second. Let's think this out. Uh, so not a bad build for a character. I think that's pretty cool. For my Elizabeth Warren, I made her a protector, Ace Mar. Uh, they are serving as the guardians of law and good, and that goes back to her law degree and also her many years as a law professor. Uh, they're expected to strike at evil, lead by example, and further the cause of justice, which very much applies to Elizabeth Warren. Now, for this one, I made her a level 18, and that was because I made a mistake. I confused 2013 when she won uh, her Senate seat with the year 2003. I subtracted a decade out of there, so I mistakenly gave her 18 uh, years as a senator is actually supposed to be eight, but you know, happy go lucky coincidence. I gave her 18 and it kind of matches um, Nate's character. She is a clockwork uh, soul sorcerer. And with this, with her uh, sorcerer origins, so with the sorcerers, their 
origin is actually part of their bloodline. So unlike wizards and warlocks, this is not something that was given to them. It's something that's passed through generation after generation. Uh, so that was a bit of a ding at uh, her particular choice of how she identified herself. Um, yes, it probably is very much a part of her bloodline, but again, we have to be careful about how we how we display our, uh, not how we display ourselves, basically how we uh, project our ourselves to the world. So with this, uh, she learns additional spells that she uh, develops at each level. So her spells that she's automatically given as part of the clockwork spells are alarm, protection from evil and good, aid, lesser restoration, dispel magic, protection from energy, freedom of movement, summon construct, uh, greater restoration, and wall of force. So she gets that uh, automatically in on top of the spells that I get to add to her later. With this, her abilities, I gave her strength 10, dexterity 14, constitution 15, intelligence 11, wisdom 15, and charisma 16. Now, with those, those were the base ability scores that I gave her. Once you add in those um, modifiers that come from not just her race, but also the class that she's chosen, that actually bumps her constitution up to 20. Her intelligence, uh, ooh, I did this completely all wrong. I read the wrong things to you. <laughs> Fun times, I'm messing up as I go. Apologies for that. I did a roll for this one, and I know that you're supposed to take what you rolled and then move it up. I like to play around with it a little bit. So sorry about that. Uh, so rewind and redo that again. Her ability scores, strength 10, dexterity 14, constitution 20, intelligence 11, wisdom 17, and charisma 20. So I flipped those rolls around a little bit because I had to really uh, bump up her constitution and charisma. And then I decided to bump up her wisdom for those whiz saves that she may have to uh, throw later. Her background for this one is actually a sage background. Again, going back to her teach, her being a law professor. Her initiative is a plus two. Her armor class is a 12, and her hit points are 164, which is, is, is pretty good. Now, because she is a sorcerer, she gets no armor, and her weapons are very light, so it's a crossbow, a dagger, and a quarterstaff. For her spells, that's where I had a little bit more fun. I chose Booming Blade. Uh, you brandish the weapon used in the spell's casting and make a melee attack with it against one creature within five feet of you. On a hit, the target suffers weapon attacks normal effects and then becomes sheathed in booming energy until the start of your next turn. If the target willingly moves five feet or more before then, the target takes 1d8 thunder damage and the spell ends. So it's a great way to add a little bit more force to uh, the weapon that she has, which again, are kind of light. Uh, for her bigger spells, I of course gave her mage armor and shield. She's definitely gonna need those, especially with an AC of 12. For um, other spells, Melf's Minute Meteors, uh, one of my absolute favorites. I really love that one. In addition to that, uh, what else did I give her? I gave her also, oh, this is one I really liked and I thought was insane, but I also really thought it was kind of cool. Uh, the Finger of Death. 
You send negative energy coursing through a creature that you can see within range, causing it searing pain. The target must make a con saving throw. It takes 7d8 plus 30 necrotic damage on a failed save or half as much on a successful one. So that actually could potentially be a lot of damage. Let's say for just mathematics sake, say you have your 7d8 and all seven of them, of them hit eight, which is, you know, highly unlikely but let's just say it does so that's seven times eight if i'm doing my math correct which I probably am not that's 56 plus 30 that's that's up to 86 um hit points that you can conceivably damage this person with so i thought that that was kind of cool uh and then there's another one that i gave her that i thought was just really fun and that was the crown of stars seven star like motes of light appear and orbit your head until the spell ends you can use a bonus action to send one of the motes streaking toward one creature or object within 120 feet of you when you do so make a ranged spell attack on a hit the target takes 4d12 radiant damage whether you hit or miss the moat is expended the spell ends early if you expend the last moat. If you have four more moats remaining, they shed bright light. So it gives her some light. But I also thought that that was fun because it's more things that get to uh, explode. And um, Abby Dalzim's Horrid Wilting. So you draw the moisture from every creature in a 30-foot cube centered on a point you choose within range. Each creature in that area must make a con saving throw. Constructs and undead are un are, are, aren't affected. Plants and water elements make this saving throw with disadvantage. A creature takes 12d8 necrotic damage on a failed save and half as much on a successful one. So with Elizabeth Warren, no, I'm not going to make her front line pretty much just like Nate. I'm going to have her in the back casting those spells that are going to be very helpful for uh, her team. I also gave her caref careful um, casting because some of these things, they're, they hit such a huge group, like the one of the horrid wilting, that if she's not careful with how she's casting it, she can wind up hurting one of the members of her party. So Nate looked a little bit more at her being reasonable, and he also looked at how she took, you know, she accepted her responsibility in claiming that she was Indigenous and listing herself as Native American. And he's looking at she's going to be the peacemaker. Me, on the other hand, I, I, again, am looking at her as being very much a part of the party, uh, but also seeing that she could do a couple of things that are just a little bit nasty. Oh, sorry, a little bit nasty, a little bit uh, underhanded, but ultimately she's doing it for the good of the party. So I played her a little bit more... Um, uh, not the peacemaker necessarily, but a little bit more as the person who uh, is going to think through some of the things that they do. But also, if if you get a little bit uh, on their nerves, they're also going to hit you with everything that they possibly have. So I know that this is not how we typically do our uh, show, but again, I didn't want to skip another week and. I, I also felt I've got Nate's stuff, so we can always make this up to you next time. Next week, we're going to look at John Lewis, and we're going to talk a little bit about who we're going to do our live shows on. This Tuesday is our live show on Putin. And so uh, since Nate isn't here for this one, uh, I'll be doing that one on my own. And that'll be on our Twitch channel. Uh, 
As always, we ask you to like, subscribe, leave comments about any political or world uh, figures or yeah, world figures that you would like us to do a um, build on and uh, check us out on Twitch uh, under the name One Alita Party. All right, so thanks so much and we will see you all next week. Thank you for joining us on another episode of So You Want to Lead a Party. Please click the subscribe button, the like button, and don't forget to ring the bell. And if you enjoyed this week's episode, check out last week's video or the YouTube suggested videos.